Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen Thompson and I'm a lecturer here in the Mathematics Department at the University of Exeter. And my research focuses on atmospheric fluid dynamics, which is the study of how atmospheres move and flow and how those flows give rise to the winds and storms that we experience every day here on Earth, but also for, and, um, corresponding to the winds and storms that we find on other planets. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this research, I think, is that it involves lots of different um, applications or methods. Um, so we bring together kind of classic mathematics, chalk and blackboard or pen and paper style with high performance computing, with um, insights from the physical sciences to help us understand the weather and climate that we find on planets both inside and outside of our solar system. Now today I'm going to be talking to you about jet streams. Now you may have heard of jet streams, right? You might have heard about them on the news perhaps or on um, weather forecasts. Um, but in the next few minutes, I'm going to answer some questions like, what is a jet stream? How do they form? What kind of jet streams do we find on other planets? And how might Earth's jet streams change under climate change? Okay, so first of all, what is a jet stream? Well, simply put, a jet stream is like a river of air running through an atmosphere. Now, jet streams can take many forms. For example, on Earth, sometimes they can be very straight. Sometimes they can be very wavy and have big meanders, much like a river, right? And those kind of disturbances, those kind of meanders, have big implications for the weather and climate that um, are experienced by countries that sit under the path of the jet stream. For example, us here in the UK. Okay, so that's what a jet stream is. How do we form a jet stream? Well, it turns out that there are many different ways that you can form a jet stream. Um, but I'm just going to talk about one of those today, um, being angular momentum conservation, okay? Right, so um, to sort of get a picture of this, I'm going to go over here to my nice Earth globe, okay? Now, if you imagine the sun is over here somewhere, the sun's um, radiation peaks in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Now, it turns out that Earth's atmosphere is not entirely transparent in the visible, but it's pretty close, okay? So a lot of the radiation we get from the sun comes in, goes through the atmosphere and reaches the surface. And when it reaches the surface, it heats the air that's down there up, okay? And warm air, when it's surrounded by cooler air, is going to rise, okay? Now that air is going to rise up from near the equatorial regions, um, and it's going to rise about 10 to 15 kilometers up until it reaches an invisible barrier we refer to as the tropopause, okay? Now if you think about it, that's not actually that far up. The Earth's radius is something like 6,300 kilometers. Right? Whereas you only have to go 10 or 15 kilometers up in the atmosphere to reach your first big boundary. Okay? Now the tropopause is um, an invisible barrier between the lower level of the atmosphere where we live, which is called the troposphere, and uh, the level above that called the stratosphere. Now as the, earth, uh, as the air rises, it hits the tropopause and it diverges. It starts to move poleward. Okay? So in the northern hemisphere it will move towards the north pole, and in the southern hemisphere it will move towards the south pole. Okay. Now the reason that that's interesting um, from a fluid dynamics point of view is because of the rotation of the Earth. Right? We all remember from school that the Earth rotates in two ways. It rotates on its axis, which is what gives us day and night, and it also rotates around the sun, which is what gives us our seasons um, through the year. Okay? Now if we think back to the rotation that happens um, that gives us our day and night, um, when, you, when you're air and you rise up and you hit the tropopause and you move poleward, one thing that you're actually doing is that you're moving towards the axis of rotation. Okay? Down here, you're quite far from the axis of rotation, but up here, you're much closer. And the reason that that matters from fluid dynamics point of view is because of something called angular momentum. Okay? So we're going to move over to a different demonstration now, um, if this will stay. Thank you. Um, with this tennis ball. Okay? So if I come here, now, I want you to imagine that you're a parcel of air sitting on the equator, okay? And you're not moving, right? You're just sitting there, um, minding your own business. Um, now, you might think, well, of course, I'm not moving, so I don't have any momentum. But actually, because the Earth is rotating, even though you're sitting still, you still have some momentum, right? You have what's called angular momentum about the Earth's rotation axis, okay? So in this analogy, you are like the tennis ball here that I'm swinging around this piece of string. Okay, now I hope you're not motion sick. Um, okay, so here we are, we're sitting on the equator and we have some angular momentum. In a mathematical sense, angular momentum is the product of the linear momentum it has, the speed it's going, multiplied by the distance from the axis of rotation. Okay, now what happens as you move poleward is that you shrink the distance to the axis of rotation. 
OK, so what I'm going to do here in this example is I'm going to pull the string and make the string shorter, which will bring the tennis ball closer to the axis of rotation. OK, so here we go. Um, here I am spinning the tennis ball, and as I pull the string in, hopefully what you'll see is the tennis ball has to speed up, right? It has to rotate around the axis much faster, right? And that's because it's trying to conserve its value of angular momentum. As I reduce the distance to the axis, it has to go faster to keep angular momentum the same, OK? So if we go back now to our Earth example over here, um, imagine again your air, you're sitting on, um, on the equator, you rise because you're warmed by the sun, you hit the tropopause, so you move poleward. As you move poleward, you get closer to the axis of rotation, and in order to conserve angular momentum, you spin up a jet stream. Right? You start flowing from west to east. Right? And this kind of jet stream we refer to as a subtropical jet stream. And the reason for this is because as you rise, you move poleward, you get to um, sort of 30 odd degrees north, and then you start descending. Right? And this circulation then closes by returning the flow near the surface to the equator. And this kind of overturning circulation we know as the Hadley cell. Okay? Um, now the descending branch of the Hadley cell sits roughly at about 30 degrees either side of the equator. It brings warm, dry air down from the upper atmosphere to the surface, which is what helps to give rise to the desert regions that we find at that range of latitudes. OK, so that's the subtropical jet and the Hadley cell on Earth. What about on other planets? Well, hopefully you can guess which kind of planet this is going to be. This is going to be Mars. OK, now, of course, these aren't to scale. Mars, in reality, is about half of Earth's radius. It's about a third of the gravity. But its surface pressure um, from the atmosphere is about 160 times less. So the atmosphere is much thinner. Now, if you take all of those factors together, um, the Hadley cell that you form on Mars actually gets much bigger. On Earth, we said it went to about 30 degrees either side of the equator. On Mars, it can go almost nearly to the pole. It can go almost all the way up to 90. Um, not quite, but almost. Um, and this gives a very, very fast set of jet streams on Mars um, formed by this angular momentum conserving Hadley cell kind of circulation. OK, so that's Earth and Mars, but they're both terrestrial planets. What's a terrestrial planet? Well, it's a, it's a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere overlaying it. Okay? But what about an atmosphere like Jupiter? Right? Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It's made almost entirely of gas, 90% hydrogen, about 10% helium. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice when you look at Jupiter is these colored stripes. Right? And these are different types of clouds. Now, it turns out that the thing that separates these different kinds of clouds are jet streams. Right? There's jet streams crisscrossing the planet between all of these different stripes. Okay? So on Jupiter, it turns out that there are about 15 jet streams in total. On Earth, there's maybe four. Um, on Mars, maybe only two. Okay, so Jupiter is in a very different regime. The other way that you can see that is um, you can see that the stripes are almost perfectly straight. Right? They run almost like along latitude circles. They don't meander in the same way that the Earth's jet streams can do. And this puts it in a very different regime. Okay. Now, the nice thing about Jupiter is that because it's covered in clouds, um, we can see those clouds being advected by the winds, and so we can visualize the winds in a movie. So this movie is taken from um, Voyager 1, the spacecraft that approached Jupiter in 1979, um, and you can see the movement of these clouds, right, which is visualizing the winds. So, for example, you can see the great red spot there in the southern hemisphere churning away, being fed by this jet stream coming in from the right, um, and producing this very big turbulent wake on the left-hand side here. So lots of beautiful fluid dynamics for us to understand. And this is something that we're working on here at the University of Exeter. OK, so just to close, I want to give you an example of an open research question that we're working on here at Exeter. OK, so one of the big issues facing us um, in this time is, of course, climate change. Right? And we all know, of course, that as we increase um, anthropogenic CO2 emissions, for example, we warm the Earth's surface globally. But interestingly enough, we also find in our predictions that the warming isn't spread uniformly across the whole world. Right? Some parts of the world are predicted to warm faster than others. In particularly the Arctic, so the North Polar regions, are predicted to warm much faster than the rest of the planet, a phenomenon known as Arctic amplification. OK, now what happens is that if this region warms much faster than the tropics, then we change something that we refer to as the equator to pole temperature gradient. OK, so in normal times, of course, the sun heats most directly near the equator, so the tropics are quite warm. So we have 
this equator to pole temperature difference. But if we warm the, the Arctic region much faster, then we change that equator to pole temperature difference. Now, the reason that I'm talking about that is that the jet streams, both their location and their strength, depends quite significantly on the magnitude and the, um, the sort of spatial structure of this equator to pole temperature difference. OK, so we change that at lower levels in this way. But in the upper levels, it turns out that near the tropopause, we actually warm the tropics much faster under climate change. So that changes the equator to pole temperature in the opposite sense. OK, so the jet streams are going to respond to these things in perhaps quite complicated ways. And this is one of the big problems that we're working on here at the University of Exeter. OK, and with that, I will bring this presentation to a close. And um, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video.